Why don't you take your helmets off in here? We're pretty safe. Okay, this is the launch control center. What's your name? Ian. Ian? Yes. Okay, Ian. You are probably a major, so congratulations. Your pay grade's got up a bit. Uh, there's four people on the crew. There was a missile combat crew commander, a deputy missile combat crew commander, which were officers. Then you had two enlisted people, a facilities, facilities maintenance facilities technician, and a guy called a VMAP, which was kind of like an electronics guy. So we take a look around here. This kind of looks like a nice room. This is a three-story building we're in right now. And of the three stories, uh, as you saw in the video upstairs, or down below, upstairs is the crew quarters where you could rest, kind of a Motel 2 if you want, not a Motel 6. It's pretty basic up there. Then we have, this is the launch area here. And then there's a third floor down below here where we have a lot of switch gear equipment for, and some batteries for backup and things like that. Um, the nice thing about this thing is it feels pretty solid here, pretty sturdy, except for one thing, we are not on the ground. We are floating about seven feet off the ground on steel springs. If you take a look around here, there's eight springs around the area here. So this is like a bird cage. You're on a bird cage. You're sitting on a So you stepped over a bridge coming in about one foot wide. So this the earth around us could move 18 or 20 inches up and down and one foot side to side, and we wouldn't even feel it here. Basically, we're shock isolated. If you take a look around here, right over here, that little that silver thing right in here, that's the air intake. You know that swamp cooler that was up above? Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't have been here. There would have been an air conditioning yeah. sucking the air down. And, and blowing it in this way, and it blows out towards the missile. So down on the down on the bottom floor, where they have the switching gear, there's a looks like a torpedo hatch, and that's our secondary escape. If that was closed, you could open that up, and there's a ladder in the air uh, coming down that you could actually climb up and get out that way. The other thing we have here, that little small thing here, that's a blast valve. That's blast valve number five. And what it does, basically, is if it detects a, an overpressure of 2 PSI, it shuts the air off to the outside to prevent anything from anything harmful from getting into the media. Also, we have over here, this is our emergency war order safe, or the EWO safe. And that's where the commander and the deputy commander, when we came on duty, you would put your lock on one side, I'd put my lock on the other side, and it takes two people to open that safe. And of course, you had to you did the secret combination that I didn't know to hold up the rest of it. But that contains our authentic cater cards and the keys to turn the missile on to set it on its way. I've got three rows of uh, antennas here. The first one being the universal one. This is a that's a big antenna you saw coming into the uh, facility. Uh, that did shortwave worldwide communications. Uh, also. That's how it's synchronized my clock to uh, uh, the atomic clock in Boulder to make sure I was on the uh, correct time. This is my command antenna. This would be all any go-to-war commands that come through this. And this is called a Slivic. It's a survivable low frequency antenna. If all the other antennas can't work, I can receive messages on this guy here. This is the alternate launch console here. The deputy commander is over here. You'd be a major, I'd probably be a first or second lieutenant. And I was in charge, if I'm over here, I'm in charge of safety and security. Safety meaning that if there's anybody out on working on the missile, I would have a high-tech grease pencil that I would write down where they're at on the site. And when they move, everybody had radios. There's some radios in the back there. Everybody have radios, they say, I'm looking from level two to level three, and it's usually a two-man, because when you're working on nuclear weapons, it's a two-man thing you saw. I watch you, you watch me. There's always two people in this in this room here, one officer, one enlisted man, at all times. So, I'd have this here, I'm also responsible, I had a key to line this clock. This is our, uh, well, we call it the go-to-war clock. It basically is a, 24-hour clock. Uh, you wind it every Sunday. It's it's an 8-day clock, but we always wind it on every Sunday. 
And right now it says it's uh, 2037. So 2037 in the evening? Well, it's not 2037 in the evening. It's actually, it's uh, 137 in the evening. Why do you think that clock would be set up 2037? It's a hostile alarm. No. no. <laughs> Actually, this is set right to your hometown of London, England, through the Zero Meridia at GMT. And it's a Zero Meridia, in the military we call Zero Zulu, so it's Zulu time to the military. So right now it's 2038 here, it's 2038 on the space station, it's 2038 in Afghanistan, it's 2038 place. So when we orchestrate a war, we want everybody to be on the same same time. I don't want to be dropping bombs when a plane's coming over and things like that. So we very graciously orchestrated the end of the war to that clock. Also, the deputy commander would uh, have access to raise and lower the antennas in case uh, one of the external antennas got blown out or went down for some reason. They could raise and lower the antennas. And also, uh, as we came down through the access portal, there was a TV camera there. They could watch the crew that was coming in to make sure that that's all that came in, that there was no other extra people. After that, uh, we had two enlisted people. Uh, the MFT, or Missile Facilities Technician, he was basically a building supervisor. He made sure the lights were running, the air conditioner was running, the toilets flashed, and things like that. He was in charge of anything to do with facilities. And he also monitored incoming power. We got our incoming power from the outside power companies, just like you do. Uh, come in at 480 volts, we'd step it down and step it down and step it down to 28 volts DC. 28 volts DC operates everything that can launch the missile, including opening the, the 760 ton door to releasing the, uh, the bolts that would uh, set the missile. And he would do that through here, but if we ever lost power, down below, underneath here, anything you see in seafoam green here runs on 28 volts DC. If power was lost, even for an instant, batteries down below would switch on to keep the missile, the guidance system running and everything working until there's a generator out in the missile silo. It takes a couple of minutes to come up on to power, and once it's stabilized on power, the battery shut off, we'd run on generator power until external power either came or we got 5,000 gallons of diesel fuel out there we could, we could just run independently if we had to. Uh, he also, uh, this was the uh, tipsy alarms that you saw and if there's any alerts that go through the security with the deputy would watch this here. Then we had a guy called the BMAT, or Ballistics Missile Analyst Technician. He wasn't really a computer guru because back in 63, they didn't have that many computers. They might have had a, a Commodore 64 or something like that, or a Trash 80 or something like that. But basically, he was an electronics technician. He was responsible for all the electronics that launched the missile. He could do non-destructive testing of the fault circuits over here. If he had a problem, we had owner's manuals here. They could take it, uh, troubleshoot it down, get the part from DM, they fly in, they fly in, fix it, you know, go from there. He also had uh, control of, uh, we had a thing called a butterfly valve. This came in in, in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, this was status of the missile, targeting, uh, power distribution here, circ critical circuit breakers here, and a thing called a MAGAT, which is a, this is how you talk to the missile. Back in 1963, uh, this thing was fully popular with transistors and heat sinks and heated this room up to an ungodly temperature. After 78, the, they thought this was like the last 10 years. After 78, this, let's extend it a little farther. They went back to AC spark plugs, which designed this thing and said, hey, let's make it. We need spare parts. They said, we don't make transistors anymore. Sorry. So they went to Delco and MIT, and at that time they were doing a universal guidance system for the 747 for overwater. They adapted it to the missile, and this replaced all of that. But to get the coordinates to the missile, we used a high-tech thing called punch paper tape. 
and this is a Mylar version of it. Basically, you get three, you have three targets. The punch paper tape would come down, the reason why they used this was because you can't erase it, you can't punch an extra hole in here, try to modify it, and even if you could read ASCII, which there's a what, two, three, five, seven, nine. Doesn't mean anything, big deal, you know. So, they would load three punch paper tapes into the reader, that would go out and, and load the targeting coordinates into the missile, for its targets one, two, and three. Wouldn't, that's all it did. Then you take the tapes, put it in the Evo safe, and in case they had to reload it or anything. Okay, Commander. So back down again. The Commander had, this is like the dashboard of your car. This showed all the status of everything going on in the site. If there was ever an error or something like that, a light would flash, uh, the, the fire anywhere, the flat points would sound, everything like that. Uh, you got three targets here, right? And you are on target number two. two. And you probably don't know anything about target number two, do you? No. And that's correct. You wouldn't know anything about it. No one knew what target two. Target two is even classified today. Uh, the reason being is some of the enemies are friends now. So, you know, you don't want to <laughs> upset people or anything like that. But the other thing I can tell about target number two is if I look at the re-entry vehicle over here, targets number one and targets number three are set for air burst. Targets number two is set for a ground burst. So an air burst is going to go up 14,000 feet above the ground and take out an area about the size of Los Angeles. This is a nine megaton hydrogen bomb. We got 54 of these things. So we're going to change the Earth somehow. A ground burst, has anybody been up to the meteor crater in Winslow, Arizona? Okay, if you haven't, it would put a hole in the ground about 500 feet deep and about three quarters of a mile wide just to take out a big chunk of Earth. So you're probably going after a hardened underground target. So this is set, and then if they had to change targeting, if they come back and said, you have to change your targeting, all you have to do is push the push button here. It would change it, and then you might have to change this from an air to a ground burst with a key over here. That'd be about it. Butterfly valve. As you saw on the, on the missile itself, there's four valves to, um, Watch the missile. There's two oxidizer and two fuel. On one of the oxidizer lines, there's, well, on all four, there's a butterfly valve, but on one of them, there's a lock. And without the right code in the lock, it won't open that valve. If that valve doesn't open, the missile doesn't fly. So there's six thumb wheels here. There's 16 characters on each wheel. So you got six to the 16th power combinations. Anybody care to no. give me a guess? No. no. <laughs> if you guess a lot, you're really close. But the commander, uh, we know already, it's 16,777,216 different combinations. But that wasn't good enough for the Air Force. They put a tries counter on here. And just like you're, if you go to an uh, ATM, put your card in, you punch it in, and on the third time, what does it do? Yeah, it works out. Each card, right? Yeah. Same thing here, seven tries, it shuts the missile down, locks that valve, and a crew has to come out and manually deactivate everything. Okay, so we're just cruising along, things are pretty nice right now, then also you may hear something like this. Sometimes it'll be a weather forecast, but other times it could be a go to war. So what the commander and I would do is, as the message came in, we would write down Alpha 3 to Charlie Hotel. In 35, there's 35 places to put the message. You can show that around. And at the end of the at the end of the first time, it says repeat. On repeat, we would swap books and verify that yes, we wrote down the same thing. Once that happens, that gives us authorization to open up the Word safe and get an authentication card out. And they look something like this, and inside it, there's a thing called a cookie. And the cookies aren't edible or anything like that, but it looks something like this. And after the, uh, like, George Alpha or something like that, there's five characters. If those five characters match the other five characters, the commander would go, oh crap. We just got a 
a bond shortage. Mm -hmm. Now, in the message itself, there's an offset. The time we get it, there's an offset that's sort of like six hours. So six hours from now, I write on the grease guns, that's when we go light some missile. Also in there would be the code for the butterfly bell. I put that in over here, and it comes up green light, okay, got the correct code. Uh, any other time, if I, if I tried to fool around that thing, they would know up at headquarters, somebody screwing around with this thing. End of your career. <laughs> so, I got the butterfly valve that says, okay, we're, we're clear to watch. Next thing we do, we go over to the state. You get your sidearm out, and I get my sidearm out, because if one of us hesitates, the other, the one that hesitates becomes an enemy combat, and you probably aren't going to live too long. <laughs> We put our keys in. I put my key in over here. Commander, you put your key in there. Yeah. They're, they're spring-loaded to the off position. I can't reach your key. You can't reach mine. You're going to take your left hand. You're going to put it on the key because everything's going to happen to your right. Yeah. And you're going to go three, two, one, turn. And turn. You're going to turn the key to the right, hold it for five seconds until you see a green light. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Yeah. Three, two, one, turn. Hold it till you see the green light. Okay, let go. You started something now, you can't stop it. So you squeeze the trigger of the gun. It's, uh, things are gonna start happening real soon. Batteries activated. Out of the missile, there's 228 volt batteries. They're being fed electrolyte for the first time in their life. They're coming up to power. It takes about 21 seconds for the batteries to come up to power, in which now the missile will be on internal power itself. Once it's on internal power, it's going to start, you're going to see things in the silo shop. That silo door takes 15 to 20 seconds for the silo door to open. As it opens, it's going to go through the tipsy alarm. As it goes through the tipsy alarm, that's the only way I know that the door's open. There's, I, mean, I can't hear anything from in here. Next thing that's going to happen, they're going to start putting water into the base, about 9,000 gallons of water in the base. So when the missile fires for noise suppression, it's going to shoot steam out the thing. As it does that, Engines fire up, I know I've got a fire thing, and then I have, four seconds later, I have lift up. It takes four seconds for the missile to get out of the tube. From time I turn the key to lift up, 58 seconds. There's no oops button, there's no turn me back button, <laughs> things like that. It's yeah, going. It's, 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 yeah. it's run away, it's, it's going to, and 30 to 35 minutes from now, Anybody that's sitting at target number two, probably going to be sitting in a hole. Yeah. Can you not stop it in it? In yeah. No. It goes. It just goes and goes and goes till it runs off you. Then it goes ballistic. The accuracy of this missile, you know, to put it into real simple terms, is like taking a golf ball, throwing it at 150 yards into a teacup. I was accurate, from 6,000 miles, I was accurate within one mile yeah. of the target. Now, you're not done yet, Commander. You've only done half a job. You launched the missile. There could be incoming missiles coming in, so you have a little reset button here that closes the silo. Even though the silo is used once, it's totally destroyed. The fire and flame is totally destroyed. Blast valve shut on takeoff because it's not like two PSI coming down. It's shut. We're on internal air. You put out the fires in here because you want to lose your air or something like that. You, the Air Force is graciously giving you 30 days of food and water. <laughs> in the book there, you go through a checklist. Everything you do is through a checklist. The last page of the checklist says, wait for further instructions. <laughs> <laughs> further instructions, uh, you got 30 days. After 30 days, you're kind of on your own. So you have a choice to make. Uh, you've got about 18 days of breathable air here, about another 10 or 15, 10 days or rebreathable air. And then being the commander that you are, you give one of your enlisted men a radio, send him up the tube to say, how's it out there? If he's alive, living, then you all climb up and go up. But obviously the world you're going to climb up into is going to be totally, totally different than the world you just left. Your other choice is to sit down here and suck Your choice. Read, read that. I turn the key. You turn the key. <laughs> along, with, 